So today we're going to continue our Frequently Asked Question Sermon Series. And today we're going to be uh, sharing a question I've received several times over the last 17 years. Why do we baptize those babies? Um, I want to give you a heads up. As we go through here today, I'm going to be talking about why we participate in the church tradition of baptizing babies. What I don't want anyone leaving here today is going up to their friend that is a believer's baptism person and saying, I told you I was right, okay? We're not here for that. What we are here to do is to say, why do we practice what we believe and move forward? Are we all on the same page on that one? This is not ammo for coffee day on Wednesday. All right. Um, I will be reading today from the uh, New Revised Standard Version in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. And we're picking up the story of uh, Paul and Silas. And of course, if you know anything about Paul, he's always causing a ruckus somewhere. But we're going to pick up the story where he and his traveling companion Silas are in jail. And they've been thrown in jail for helping out. Uh, there was a young girl that had a, a, apparently some kind of spiritual demon or something. They had cast it out, and they got in trouble for doing that good work. So we're going to catch them here in jail. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had all escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he is in, and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, we do pray that you open up our hearts and our minds and our souls in the ministry of your word. I pray that you hide me behind the cross and allow your living water to flow to this earthen vessel. Amen. So, I go through and I approach Pastor Cal and I say, Cal, I want to be baptized. And he said, well, that's awesome. What's going on in your life that has brought that about? And I told him how I felt like the Spirit of God was at work and that I wanted to be baptized. He said, that is awesome that God is doing this. But, um, well, were you baptized? I said, well, you know, I was baptized as a baby, but this one's for real. And he said, well, now, who works in baptism? And I said, well, I'm kind of new at this, but I think I lucky answered and said, God. And he said, okay, okay, so God is at work in baptism. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, has God been faithful so far in your experience? And I said, well, yeah, I think God is, is faithful. And he said, so let's, let, let's think through this. To be rebaptized is like telling God you didn't do it right the first time. Let's try again. And I was like, oh. Okay, I don't need to be baptized again, but I need to do something with this. And so when I went and I joined the church, I reaffirmed my baptismal vows. I reaffirmed faith in Christ. Um, and guess what? God was faithful in God's covenant that was made with me and my parents when I was six weeks old. That covenant lasted through a lot of stuff. God was faithful through me searching in foreign lands for God. God was faithful to uphold the covenant when I wasn't exactly holding up my end of the bargain, right? Matter of fact, I'll be frank with you, I didn't even have faith in God. And yet God's covenant upon my life lasted until finally I woke up to what God had been doing all along. Cal was right. God did it right the first time. 
Today, I want us to approach this, uh, uh, this question, and hopefully many of you who have raised children um, went through and said, well, are we having our kids baptized or not? I hope some of you who might be in this room who have not had your children baptized don't go through and think, oh, I've been wrong or whatever. That's not the point. What I do hope we do is take a deep stock of the biblical and traditional approach to baptism so that it has a living meaning for us today. It's not just something we do because, well, that's what we do. There's a reason for it. Now, it might seem a little bit obscure that we start with this passage in particular. Hopefully right now you're like, okay, Paul, Silas, prison, jailer, what does this have to do with why do we baptize babies? Let's explore the story, and then I think you're going to understand a little bit more of why. In this passage, it's no mistake that it's Paul and Silas who are in jail. And folks, when they say they were in jail, this is not here's your jumpsuit and three square meals a day kind of prison. This is dark, dank, cave-type dwelling. There are no hygiene facilities, and if you don't have friends on the outside, you will starve to death in this prison because there are no meals provided and it's in the midst of this not only in this environment but locked in chains what do Paul and Silas do I think they remind us that as Christians no matter what difficulty we're going through in life that pessimism and defeatism and you know poor me oh this is too bad this is horrible that's not the response of a person with the Holy Spirit in their life in the midst of prison, the text tells us they were singing hymns to God. They were offering prayers to God. And everyone else around them heard it. Let's set aside the earthquake and all that stuff for a minute. Let's fast forward to the jailer. Now, it's not a mistake. There's a couple of different levels uh, of interpretation or reading between the lines that happens here with this jailer. And in essence, the, the in between the lines is to say... Paul and Silas, they're the ones that don't have any freedom. They're the ones that are in jail. It's the jailer who is, to all appearances, he's free, right? He's going to go home to his family later on that day. And yet he's the one that doesn't have freedom. Paul and Silas in chains and free on the outside and bound and not free. Something here and here clicks. The Holy Spirit has descended into this circumstance, and the jailer goes through and says, what must I do to have this, to have salvation? And he points to this accompanying factor of God's presence no matter what. That is salvation for us to know God and to know God's presence in our daily lives. And he wants exactly what Paul and Silas have. And they respond with, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your whole household will be saved. Now this is the part we want to get to as well, or the next part we want to get to. When they get there, the, the, the text says that um, uh, the jailer and the entire household are saved. They're all baptized now, you want to talk about a broad swath. In the Greek, when it says the entire household is baptized, um, whenever you're in seminary and you're surrounded with all your little theological nerd friends, and you're talking about, well, the Greek text says this, and it could be that, you know, those kind of things. <laughs> you engineers did that in engineer school, too. So um, a few of you get what I'm talking about. <laughs> this statement about the entire household, it means everybody. It means regardless if they had faith or not. In this culture, as regrettable as it is, that meant the slaves in the household were baptized too. Did they believe in God? Who knows? But they were baptized. What about the teenagers? They were baptized. What about the children in the household? When it says the entire household, the theological nerd in us would sit around going, well, does that mean the family dog? Well, probably not. But it does say this powerful entire. There's almost this notion where if you were very liberal with the translation, the, the, the furniture, the, the, the oil lamp, um, the rug, the bed, everything's baptized. That's how inclusive this thing is. And it's not a mistake that in the passage just before this, 
Lydia and her entire household are baptized. And we see this pattern emerge as the gospel takes root in a responsible adult's uh, life that they and their entire household, insert here, babies, are baptized. And we see that in the scriptures that there is a biblical warrant for babies to be baptized. Not only that, you can look at Matthew chapter 19. And remember, Jesus is trying to teach the crowds and the disciples. God bless the disciples. They get it wrong sometimes, but it's to our benefit. We learn a lot from them. The disciples are saying, get those crying kids out of here. Matter of fact, that crying baby over here, I hope that kid stays right here. Don't let that kid go anywhere, right? These disciples are telling the babies to stay away, keep them away. Anybody remember what Jesus said? Let those children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such as these belong the kingdom of God. In another passage, he talks about um, metaphorically. Everybody's clear, metaphorically. Tie, it's better to go through and tie a millstone around your neck and go try to swim than it is to impede with one of these kids coming to the kingdom of God. You're kind of seeing that the scriptures bear a very clear witness that in any avenue we can offer grace to a child you're supposed to do it and in baptism God's grace is imparted upon us for the the the, the washing away of our sin for the restoration of our truest humanity that we might be the covenant people of God covenant people if these particular examples aren't, aren't, aren't very clear for you, let's think back to the way that God has worked throughout human history. After all, um, one of the big calls of, of uh, what we call, a, and again, this is a friendly thing, I'm not after anybody, but our friends in the believer's baptism part of our church is that, well, they didn't decide, they didn't make a choice to have this baptism. Um, that doesn't count. Folks, look at God's history throughout the Bible. From the very beginning, God made a covenant with people. Did Abraham and Sarah, when God told them that they would have a great nation to follow after them, and that they would be the chosen children of God, they would be the covenant of God, did anyone after them, Moses or any of the rest of them, have a choice in what God declared about their life? No. They were born into the covenant of God, like it or not. Now, as Americans, we don't like that, do we? I'm an individual and I have my freedom. Well, yeah. But guess what? The choice to be a part of God's people, you can choose to walk away from it, but because you're born into it, because you're born into it in the waters of baptism, yeah, you have the choice to walk away from it. But folks, salvation in Jesus Christ does not start with a choice. It starts with God. It's God's covenant to us the biggest um, uh, rub I would have with some of the believers baptism stuff is it puts so much focus on the individual and what I'm going to let God do in my life and we're going to talk about that here for just a moment salvation that's God's business it doesn't start with you it starts with God and it's because God loves us that he sent his one and only son it's because of who God is that God created the heavens and the earth. It's because who God is that our sins are forgiven. It all starts with God. And so when we talk about this notion of covenant, it always starts here, and that's with God. Now, the big question that I'm hoping you're asking, well, wait a minute, don't I have to do something in there? I'm glad you asked. I sit with the uh, uh, parents who are having their children baptized. I also sit with confirmand confirmands, and I talk about these two parts of a covenant. If you've ever had a, a, a real estate transaction, there are at least two parties involved, right? Um, if you've ever had a, 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 any kind of a contract, there are at least two parties. You can kind of sort of think of that for just a moment. God. God says, I love I choose you. I want you to be my own. That's what baptismal waters are. The other person then at some point 
has to take up its part in that covenant. The parents, the sponsors, they carry those vows. They raise the child in the Christian faith so that they will be able to make a choice to respond to that baptism so that they are able then to take up that baptism as their own. In essence, it's like the Hebrew children saying, hey, I am a Hebrew. I am a Hebrew. Because guess what? They also had a choice to wander off into the wilderness and to live life the way they wanted to. You do have a choice. But even the ability to respond is because God has been at work in your life. This, this notion of covenant, this ability to respond, that's what we see as a big focus, I'm particularly here in the, in the Bible Belt where we hear a lot more about believers' baptism, is the focus upon this part. Now, um, I got asked uh, several questions in between about um, what does this mean for the, the very nature of salvation. Remember that before you're ever aware of God, God already is at work in your life. God has already been putting people, experiences, things to help draw you near to God before you're ever aware of it. How many countless examples were there people of grace in your life before you became aware of it? How many times did you hear of God's grace or experience God's love in your life before you realized, oh my goodness, that must be God? Huh. Is God not working a saving work in your life all along? At some point, then, we say, thank you for it. The example, have a pen. I sit with confirmands, and this is, this is whenever, matter of fact, those of you in confirmation, in three months, act surprised when I meet with you, okay? <laughs> but we talk about salvation. This is God's gift of grace, mercy, forgiveness, new life, and Jesus Christ. And in baptism, what we, in essence, do is that is set there for you. And it's borne up for you, but at confirmation, it's presented to you and you have a choice. Say thank you, or you turn it loose. That, my friends, is where choice emerges. It's not on, am I going to save myself? Am I going to take up the thing that God has already presented to me or not? The miracle of God's grace is, it's always there. I can bear witness to that. The grace that was poured out in my baptism, it sat right there and it sat on a proverbial spiritual shelf for 21 years until I went, oh, where did that come from? Right? The nature of salvation and the reason why this passage is so critical in, in our understanding of how baptism would work is that you notice in the jailer and in his faith the whole household begins being there's an ing on this being saved why well as we said salvation is the ability to know god and to be known to god to experience the presence of god to know life eternal that's hebrew code language for the life of god now and whatever happens when our mortal body ceases I'm sure it's good because God is there. But we would know the life of God. And so this entire household begins to experience grace. And from God's end, that's salvific. At some point, these people in the household, they would have had to pick up their part of the covenant, wouldn't they? They would have had to adopt uh, that part. The uh, last movement here I want to offer to you, where did the notion of not baptizing babies emerge. Because guess what? In the very, very, very first century, the whole family's baptized, okay? We see throughout the, the, the early part of, of the book of Acts, it's adults being baptized, because guess what? They're just now coming to hear the gospel in the first place. But obviously, in a very short order, the entire household is receiving the sacrament. When we go through and we look in the historical records of the early church, Kids, they're baptized. You look at St. Augustine, baptize those babies. St. Ignatius, baptize those babies. We can fast forward all the way to Martin Luther, 
the, 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 the reformer, the Protestant reformer, what does he say? Baptize those babies. John Calvin. Now, John Calvin, I don't agree with theologically on a lot. He's the one that says that your predestination. In other words, if you're saved, you're going to heaven, and God picks you to go to hell, you just go to hell. I don't believe that's true, and I don't think the Scriptures warrant that. But even John Calvin baptized those babies. One baptism for all of a person's life. And then there emerges a movement, and they're called the Anabaptists. A-N-A Baptists. And that literally means the rebaptizers. And I want to be fair here to say that they observe something going on in Christianity, and that's why they said that infant baptism was invalid and you had to be baptized as an adult. Now, it was a total heresy. There was a lot of bad stuff that followed, but the fact is they said something what we need to hear. There were entire families who were saying, well, we got the kid done, we're finished. God's grace, oh, they've been baptized, and then they go off and become bank robbers and heathens and say, well, they're fine. Little Johnny, he can't help it. But he's baptized, right? What the Anabaptists said to the Christian world, and we need to hear their voice, that's not what it means to be the covenant people of God. You don't take grace for granted and be dismissive of it going forward. This covenant business, it's serious. It has consequences. It calls us to account before God and one another. And so I just want to say that our Anabaptist friends, I'm, 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 uh, I think, well, God bless them. There's too much emphasis on what I'm doing for me. And folks, you're wonderful. I've met so many of you, and I love who I'm seeing you to be. And as precious and wonderfully made in the image of God you are, I got to tell you, it ain't about you. In the midst of us, it's about we as the covenant people of God. And at those waters, what we are doing is we are incorporating these children into God's saving with an ING work among us. You, 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 you're a part of that. But it's we, the covenant people of God. Scripture, baptize those babies. Tradition, baptize those babies. Um, experience, baptize those babies. Reason, baptize those babies. You want to know why we do it? Well, that's what we've always done. But apparently God's still doing a new thing among us through it. Some of you, this might have prompted some big questions, and that's good. I like questions. Shoot me an email, call, we can set up a time and chit-chat. Um, but I hope that this has equipped you a little bit more to know why we do what we do. Next week, these are giant air quotes. We're going to talk about a woman's place. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll find it interesting. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace, and thank you, God, for this uh, covenant people that we get to be a part of. Um, we ask, God, that you would continue to use us to share your good news to all who would hear it in Christ's name. Amen.